as Forbo mentioned just a few minutes ago, we're in a series which is called Simply Irresistible. Uh, for those of you who uh, remember Robert Palmer, you'll remember his song. No, I'm not about to burst into that. The lyrics from memory are, yes, someone's very happy that I'm not going to sing that. I think it was enough me singing a country song a couple of weekends ago. Uh, but Simply Irresistible and looking at some of the qualities of the Christian life that are attractive to people. Uh, that's one of the things, and we're going to read from the book of Titus in a moment. One of the things I, I love about Bayside Church is that people who are not necessarily Christian, they don't necessarily, wouldn't even think of normally darkening the door of, of a church building or a church service, um, they, they find something about Bayside attractive. I've had some incredible conversations over the last few weeks, especially with people in the media uh, who, who are not religious, they're not Christian. I, I had an SMS the other night um, from a lady who produces a very well-known program uh, on Australian television, and she said to me, she said, I, this is Tuesday night, the night of the execution. She said, I'm not religious, but right now I'm praying for a miracle. And so there's been many conversations like that with different people. Um, who, and, and, and I believe that the gospel, that Christianity should be attractive. Amen? It should be if we're living right, simply irresistible. And so, last week we looked at the generous life and I taught you a little saying. Does anyone remember what that saying was? It started with generosity. That's all repeated after me. Generosity has nothing to do with how much I have. Amen. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. And uh, Titus is a little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to, uh, to Titus, this guy. This is one of the pastoral epistles. It's written to a pastor. At this particular time, Titus was the leader of all the churches on the island of Crete. And he writes there in Titus 1 and verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so this island, one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean, it's near Greece, uh, just north of uh, Libya, and it was a very prosperous island back in the first century. In fact, it was known as the Island of a Hundred Cities, and the Apostle Paul had spent time on this island going around and pioneering churches, and Paul only spent a very short time. He would normally spend three or four months in each place. He moved very, very fast. He would move in find a few people that were interested in the gospel, get a small group of people together, and then he'd leave. And he'd go to the next place, and then sometime later he'd go back and see if anyone was still there. <laughs> it's a very interesting strategy. And uh, so he, Titus was part of his ministry team, and he said to Titus, I'm moving on, but I'm going to leave you in Crete, because I want you, uh, as he says there, he says, I want you to put in order what was left unfinished, and, and then he said, I want you to appoint elders or pastors. This, this word elder is not to be confused. It's used interchangeably in the New Testament. You'll find it used in Acts 20 for elders, pastors, shepherds, bishops, overseers. What he's talking here about is appointing leadership teams in every church. And so it's likely that there was a church in all of the hundred towns or cities in Crete. And Titus was overseeing all of those. He was the first multi-site pastor. This was, uh, this was the uh, campus churches of Crete, if you like, if you want to use modern day terminology. Now, with that background in mind, I want you to go over to chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, he says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to good people. Sorry, did I say something wrong? Ah, oh. the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Wow. I had a wonderful conversation a while ago with someone who, and they said, I'm really concerned about people that teach about extreme grace. I said, really? Why? Said, grace by the very nature of it is extreme. It's like an oxymoron putting those two. It 
grace is extreme. That's what grace is. It's the same as, you know, as I said before, I've had a number of interesting conversations uh, over the last few years with people who didn't understand or, you know, don't understand why we were advocating for these two men who trafficked drugs or at least tried to traffic drugs out of Indonesia into Australia. And I had one guy come to me one day and, and he said, but they, they don't deserve mercy. I said, I can't agree with you more. And he looked at me like a rabbit stuck in headlights. Don't deserve mercy. I said, I couldn't agree with you more. He said, what do you mean? I said, no one deserves mercy. That's why it's mercy. <laughs> mercy is something that we don't deserve. And so is grace. And both are extreme. And the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. In other words, you will never lock eyes with someone who is outside the realms of the grace of God, no matter who they are or what they've done. And we don't have to like what they did and we don't have to agree with what they did. I certainly don't agree with what the Bali Nine tried to do or any other drug trafficker or any other criminal. This is not about being soft on justice. I wish all drug traffickers were caught. I wish all uh, drugs were limited uh, from doing the damage that they have done and are doing to countless individuals and families around Australia and Indonesia and other nations. But I want to say in the midst of all of that, there is not one person who finds themselves outside the realms of the grace of God when they turn to Him looking for it. Let's read on. Chapter 2 and verse 12. It teaches us. Now the it there is God's grace. So God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And then Paul says to Titus, he said, these things then, uh, these are the things you should teach as a pastor. That's why I'm teaching them because I'm a pastor too. He says, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Now, if you look at the context of the verses that we have just read, in the first 10 uh, verses you can read in your own time, but what Paul is teaching here is teaching about living our lives in such a way, look at verse 10 with me, living our lives in such a way so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. That word attractive there means appealing. It means simply irresistible. In other words, people of God, Christian men and women, the way we live our lives is to be attractive to those who don't know Jesus yet. Isn't it an absolute tragedy that so often the church and Christians are known for all that we are against and we moralize? I've seen some of the most unkind comments on Facebook even this week. I had to say to one guy, I said, could you please stop writing this stuff now? I am grieving for two men who have become great friends. Could you just give me a little while? There's a Christian guy. And then he wouldn't. He just kept going. So, oh. How unattractive is that? How unattractive when the church becomes the moral police, that we're known for everything that we're against? rather than living our lives in such a way as the Apostle Paul is saying here, so that in every way they may make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive, appealing, simply irresistible. And we do that by saying no and saying yes. In uh, the first part of verse 12, saying no. God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. The grace of God is extreme, but it's not cheap. 
The grace of God is not an excuse to live an impure, immoral life. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Let me define those two things for you. Ungodliness is believing in God while adopting a lifestyle which seems to contradict your belief. We commonly refer to it as hypocrisy. And that's one of the things that the broader community find incredibly unattractive about church and Christianity when we preach a message but then don't live up to it. We preach ourselves at this high standard rather than talking about ourselves as works in progress who are still imperfect and haven't got it all together. We come across as holier than thou and when people find out we're not holier than thou, they go, bunch of hypocrites. We want to join that mob, bunch of hypocrites. I always say, we can handle another one. But that's ungodliness. Ungodliness says, I know this is wrong, but God will forgive me and goes ahead and does it anyway. Worldly passions are the tendency to conform to the world. It's following the crowd. Both of those things cheapen grace and make Christianity unattractive to the people around us. Cheap grace was alive and well in the first century church. Paul addressed it in Romans chapter 6, 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, by no means, or in the King James, God forbid. Because there were people in the first century church who were saying, well, God forgives us when we sin, so let's sin more to enable God to be more gracious. And Paul's going, no! Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. So he says, channel your energy, not in a sinful way, but in a serving way. Author Paul Ellis puts it this way, grace is no more a license to sin than electricity is a license to electrocute yourself. Beautifully put. And so God's grace teaches us to say no, but it also teaches us about saying yes. If you look at the second part of verse 12, it says God's grace teaches us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. That is, our lives will be decent, honest, respectable and consistent with our belief in God. A life like that is simply irresistible. He says, exercise self-control or self-restraint. This is the opposite of excess. Someone bought me three bars of chocolate the other day. It was very nice. Thank you, Jacob. (laughs) Orange chocolate. He asked Gigi, he said, what's your dad's favourite chocolate? And he said, orange chocolate. Orange chocolate is yummy. I said, now please don't all buy me a bar of orange chocolate (laughs) the next week. And a few weeks later, you see Pastor Rob, larger than he used to be. The other night I was just, I was sitting at home and I felt like a bit of chocolate. So I got one of the bars and I opened it up and I took two squares. (laughs) There's a bit of pride coming out right now. And I ate the two squares. And, uh, And I thought, you know, this is a wonderful sermon illustration. I can demonstrate to the congregation my great self-control and then I ate the rest of the bar (laughs) so it's my confession session anyone in good company am I in good company okay yeah I thought I had to do that you know because Christy when she opens a bar of chocolate the whole thing has to go in one night and the kids are the same so so there goes my sermon illustration but uh Self-control is to exercise restraint. Self-control is doing what I need to do when I don't feel like doing it and it is not doing what I should not do when I do feel like doing it, if you follow me. Let me give you some examples of self-control. Example one, if someone is rude to me or says something offensive, my flesh wants to respond by telling them where to go. Self-control is required to display love and kindness. Let me tell you how much self-control I do exercise when I'm on Facebook, trying to correct some of the obnoxious people who interact with me on there. Example two, the number of times I've written something and then rewritten it, and then rewritten it, and then deleted it. (laughs) Example two, if I am feeling flat or things aren't going right in my life, self-control is required for me to display joy. 
Example three, when I'm struggling financially and the economy is bad, self-control is required to have peace. And my final example, example number four, when I'm running late and there's a person in front of me who can't read the massive sign that says, keep left and less overtaking. (laughs) Self-control is needed (laughs) to be patient. Titus chapter two then gives us two reasons that empower us to live this life of saying no to the wrong things and saying yes to the right. Reason number one is looking forward. Reason number two is looking back. If you look at verse 13, looking forward, he says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we're looking forward to the second coming. Why do I say no to doing the wrong thing and and yes to doing the right thing? Because Jesus is coming back, that's why. And number two, looking back, verse 14. Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's the work that we've seen in our lives personally. That's my testimony. That's my story. That's what I saw in Andrew Chan and Mayuran Sukumaran. I saw two men who Jesus gave his life for. He redeemed them, emancipated them, set them free. Andrew said to me one day years ago, he said, I might be behind bars, but I have never been so free in all my life. Freedom right there. Why? Free in Christ. They were set free from all wickedness. They did not die as drug traffickers. That's what they were. That is not what they became. They were purified. God is looking at redeeming people and purifying them for his very own and putting that quality in our life, eager to do what is good. Those men spent every day doing what was good. Andrew would get up at six o'clock in the morning and he would the first thing he would do is go and unlock the chapel so people could come in and pray. He spent his days discipling people, doing Bible studies, counselling, encouraging. He taught hospitality, first aid, all of these different things that equipped people. I met a man earlier this year while I was visiting Andrew in prison and uh, Andrew introduced me to this guy. His name escapes me, but he, he was a multiple offender. He was in and out of Karaba Khan several times all of his life. He'd met Andrew and, and he'd become a Christian and then he was released from jail and now he is completely reformed. This man is now married. He and his wife are expecting their first child and he's holding down a full-time job as a security guard. That's just one of hundreds of stories as a result Something happens when Jesus comes into your life. You become a person that is eager to do what is good. Jesus did us good and then he puts goodness in us. Jesus redeemed or emancipated us. Just like he did for John Newton, the author of the much loved hymn Amazing Grace. John Newton was both a slave and then a slave trader. He trafficked people And yet he came to know the freedom and grace that only Jesus can give. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And so in the still of the night air of Nusa Kambangan Island, condemned prisoners sang amazing grace just after midnight. Pastor Karina De Vega, who was there, one of the spiritual advisors, she said, and I quote, it was breathtaking This was the first time I witnessed someone so excited to meet their God. Pastor Lee Carlson, who's a a very dear friend from Bali, he pastors a great church in Bali, uh, and he posted this on Facebook the other day. While Andrew was was in the holding cell prior to execution, he shared the gospel with the only Indonesian among the nine, or then the eight, to be executed. The man was a Muslim who subsequently had a vision of the Lord Jesus, which is quite common among Muslims who give their life to Christ. Andrew also taught everyone a song, which was 10,000 Reasons. 
And as they were being led to the firing squad, they were all singing. Andrew was heard encouraging them to sing louder. There were about 15 of the guards who were visibly upset. Andrew went and embraced each of the 15 guards and said he forgave them for what they were about to do. Apparently they were still singing when the shots rang out and silenced them. While some continued to focus on what Andrew Chan and Maya and Sukumaran did just over a decade ago, we will choose because of the amazing grace of God to focus on what they became. John Newton, the slave who became a slave trader, a people trafficker, became a pastor. So did Andrew Chan. Mayu and Sukumaran became a painter and an amazing artist. They both leave a remarkable legacy of the people they've reformed and led to faith in Jesus. I find it more than a coincidence that eight forgiven traffickers of drugs would sing a hymn written by one forgiven trafficker of people as they were led out to the killing fields. The song Amazing Grace is the best known and best loved hymn of all time. I had a tweet this week said this, Rob Buckingham, I am an atheist, but that hymn has always brought me undone, all the more so now. It will always speak to me of bravery. I invite you as my church family, would you all stand and let's declare the words of this amazing song.